Elliot Seaburn set his glass of pure Glenmorangie on the table at the side of the comfortable chair in his darkened office. The office lights were off and the curtains were drawn tightly, shielding him from the bright afternoon Dallas sun. Elliot was alone in his office with his thoughts. Thoughts of anger, sadness, and yes, murder. Just a few hours earlier, his life had been almost perfect. Now, however, he was in the shit. He had picked up a contract to sell his plumbing company for pennies to his main competitor. He considered signing it, but that would mean he'd have to leave his comfy chair and walk over to the desk to sign legibly. Signing on his lap meant his handwriting would appear weak and unfinished. He set the contract aside, picked up a glass of single malt and brought it to his lips. The 45-year-old Elliot was a fan of most hard liquors. He didn't mix alcohol and drank mostly clear, sometimes with ice. What he drank often depended on his mood. At the moment, his mood was gloomy. Gloomy was scotch, too, preferably single malt and no ice. Only a fucking idiot puts ice in a glass of single malt scotch, he glimpsed. His thoughts flickered to the side. No one had ever accused Elliot of thinking linearly. His mind was flexible, some would say very cabinet-like. That was probably why he had grown his fledgling company into a multi-million dollar firm in just 17 years. Elliot didn't follow bare-knuckle fighting very closely. Like most people who aren't in the tank, he knew who Conor McGregor was and a few others. He had seen a few fights, but it wasn't something he followed more than the corner of his eye. However, he had learned two things. Mixed martial arts. Fighters can endure pain and have incredible determination. Perhaps he should have shown more determination, taken more blows, so to speak, rather than giving up so easily. He took another sip of scotch then set the glass down again. Taking the contract, he growled quietly, then tossed it on the table. Let the battle begin, he thought to himself. Becky, he shouted to the secretary whose desk was outside his office. Find me that hookworm, Lester Wilkins. It had been hours since Elliot's world had crumbled, at least for the moment. Elliot sat awkwardly in a chair across from his chief competitor, Dan Baranski, president of Flotech International. Flotech was the largest competitor of Elliott's firm, Seaburn's Manufacturing Inc. for plumbing supplies in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Seaburn's was about three times the size of Flotech, and Baranski founded it about a year after Elliott founded his company. Seaburn's and Flotech, among others, always seemed to be epic competitors for government contracts. Seaburn's got the lion's share of the wins. Just as when the pair attended the same high school and college, Elliott always seemed to get the lion's share of the wins. Elliot was wary of this encounter, especially in his opponent's territory. But Dan, the drill to those who knew him well, had insisted that Elliot hold this meeting away from prying eyes. This was the first time the boar had used this technique, so Elliot decided he needed to find out what the deal was this time. He told Becky where he was going and told her to call the police if he wasn't back by noon. It was a little after nine in the morning when Boar placed the contract on the table in front of Elliot. Why would I want your company, Boar? Elliot asked. You should read it more carefully, my friend, Boar smirked. I don't want you to buy my company, I'm buying yours. Elliot studied the contract for about five minutes, and the more he read, the angrier he got. After about three pages, he stopped, threw the document on the table, and started to rise from his chair when Boar spoke again. Sit back on your ass and review this one before you act in haste, you smug bastard, Boar grinned. He turned the laptop toward Elliot and slid it across the table. On the screen was a picture of Elliot's wife of 22 years, Tracy, lying across an untidy bed with her legs spread. Elliot's eyes nearly popped out of his orbits. Bohr smirked. What kind of Photoshop crap are you trying to sell? Elliot shouted. There's no Photoshop. Take a closer look at the whole picture, asshole. Bohr grinned. Elliot stared at Bohr, then back at the photo. Carefully, closely. The only items of Tracy's clothing were the black stitched stockings and black stiletto heels he'd seen before. Then he noticed the sheets, pillows, and wallpaper behind the bed, all of which he'd seen before, too. The picture had been taken in the bedroom he shared with Tracy. You're a bastard, Elliot shouted. I'll kill you for touching my wife. Burr raised his hands in a sign of surrender as Elliot began to circle the table. Hey, you big boy. To your precious princess, I did nothing. And from what I've been told, everything that was done was done with her consent, participation, and appreciation. 
So we're now talking about a bunch of photos and videos that may become available to the public. Unless, of course, you want to be reasonable and cut a deal, Bohr said, pointing to the contract. Photos and videos? Oh, shit, Elliot hissed. Bohr returned the computer to his side of the desk, pressed a few buttons, and turned it back to Elliot. Here, the scene was completely different from what was in the picture. Here, Tracy entered another bedroom fully clothed, followed immediately by a dark-haired man Elliot didn't know. The pair merged in a deep kiss before clothes began to fall to the floor. The unknown man appeared to be the same age as Elliot and Tracy. Elliot could see that the man was incredibly handsome, and when his pants and underwear were removed, Elliot was shocked at how enthusiastic Tracy was. I love the way you have me, Sugar Plum. Sugar? Repeated in Elliot's mind, Elliot could see his wife's arousal level rising. It wasn't long before she screamed incoherently and experienced her first finish. Burr reached for the computer and stopped the video. For several minutes, Elliot sat like a man in a coma, his stomach practically twisted. Before signing off, can I at least get the courtesy of taking this home and reviewing it? He asked quietly. Sure, you and your lawyer have 24 hours, no more than that, Bohr said. Here, you can have this video. You'll get the rest when you sign the contract. How often? How many videos? A stunned Elliot asked. Enough to fill a small box. The stud says your wife is pretty damn good and really appreciates a big tool wielded by a professional. He also assures you that she's a very loud, expressive slut. By now, they've been doing it two or three times a week for two months. Elliot had a hard time reconciling the images he saw with the sexually conservative woman to whom he had been married for 22 years, the mother of his 20-year-old son and 17-year-old daughter, and a regular volunteer at their church. I have to admit, I was surprised it happened so quickly, Burr scoffed. Tracy had always been such a good girl. I figured it would take three months or more, though her lover said he could get her on board in two or less. That bet cost me another $500 on top of my fee. At these words, Elliot raised his head, and there was a puzzled expression on his face. Are you telling me you paid some son of a bitch to seduce and fuck my wife? Elliot spat out. You sick bastard. Couldn't beat me so you went after my wife? What the hell is wrong with you? Elliot started to rise from his chair. Burr didn't even move, sitting back in his chair and grinning like a cat that ate a mouse. Just try it and it'll all go public, he said. Elliot stopped moving and froze for what seemed to him like an eternity, though really only about ten seconds. He picked up the contract and the video and practically staggered out of Flotec's office. On the way back to his office, Elliot thought about his tangled history with Bohr. As teenagers, they had gone to the same high school, where Elliot was a star student and athlete, and Bohr was an outsider in both. Elliot was an honor student in high school a tough middle infielder and the starting pitcher on the baseball team. Bohr was a receiver on the soccer team and a backup on the baseball team. In fact, the school's soccer team reached the Texas State Finals in its class, but lost when Bohr dropped a perfect pass to Elliott in the opponent's defensive zone in the final seconds of the game. Elliott took the loss hard, but still tried to console Bohr after the game. Many other players shunned Bohr, both boys attended the University of Texas at Austin, but didn't run into each other very often, despite taking the same business classes. It was there that they both met Tracy. Bohr asked the well-built blonde out on a date the first month of their freshman year, but she turned him down. A couple months later, Tracy was asked out by Elliot, and she said yes. Soon after, the couple became exclusive, dated for the rest of their college careers, and married the year after graduation. She probably wouldn't even remember Bohr if he hadn't attended many of the same social events in Dallas that she and Elliot did. Elliot had told her that Bohr headed a rival firm and that he would prefer she stay away from him, which she usually managed to do. At the firm with which Flotech regularly did business, the assistant vice president was Greg Silverman. Bohr had run into him at a bar on a golf course in Dallas and had watched Greg charm virtually every woman there. Greg was twice divorced, but since he was single at the time, Bohr realized he had found the right man to seduce Elliot's wife. Bohr agreed to pay Greg a handsome fee for this part-time job. Greg began his seduction by showing up at the church the Seaburns attended and quickly volunteered for one of the committees on which Tracy was volunteering. They became friends. 
and Tracy didn't even think twice about it when Greg soon began meeting her for coffee and lunches. As a stay-at-home mom, Tracy considered herself a faithful wife who simply enjoyed the company of her male friend. Madly in love with the one he considered his best friend, Elliot never for a moment questioned Tracy's comings and goings. She never told her husband about coffee and lunches with Greg, and when she started going out to dinner with him, she told her husband she was with her friends. She knew she was taking irresponsible risks with her explanations to her husband, even though she realized she was technically playing within the rules. After their second dinner date, the couple went to Greg's apartment. Tracy knew she shouldn't go into his apartment, but after a few glasses of wine at dinner, she felt great. And Greg, for his part, was on his best behavior, so she thought, what the hell? Two hours later, the pair were in bed, cuddling and giggling, after what Tracy thought was the best sex she'd ever had. Surprisingly, she didn't feel guilty about what they had both just done. At that moment, she realized she would do it again. For the next two months, they both repeated it two or three times a week. Each time they mated, Tracy felt herself having an increasing physical connection with Greg. Five minutes later, Elliot received a call back from Lester Wilkins. By then, Elliot had watched the video in its entirety, which included the second round and enjoying the aftertaste. Apparently, Tracy was unaware that her lover was recording their sessions and had been very open about her feelings for Greg, both during and after sex. If he had any doubts about where his marriage was headed after the first picture and video, there were none after the second. Hey, Huck, I need you to get the divorce papers ready for me as soon as possible, he said after the couple exchanged the customary greetings. Make sure Tracy gets everything she's entitled to, but not a penny more. After a noticeable pause, Wilkins replied, Really, Al? This isn't a joke, because it's not funny. After an equally long pause on his end, Elliot replied, Seriously, she's been cheating on me for a couple months now, and I'm pretty sure she's even fallen for the guy. It's a long story, Huck. I'll tell you about it sometime later. I'm sorry, Elliot, I really am, Wilkins said. Elliot arrived home at his usual time of 5.30. He could tell by the smells coming from the kitchen that Tracy was cooking dinner. Then he heard her talking to their daughter, Judith. Elliot had to hand it to his wife. She was as calm as a boa constrictor, which she obviously had been since she started cheating. She looked beautiful and collected as he walked up to her and kissed her on the lips. He tried to be careful as he sniffed her, trying to determine if she had had sex that day. Now that he knew what to look for, it was easy to detect that she smelled strongly of soap, and that probably meant she had showered after sex that afternoon. Elliot waited until Judith had gone to her room after dinner, and then he told Tracy that they needed to talk. For the first time since all this had started, Tracy's face showed some concern. Do you love him, Tracy? How long has this been going on? Elliot whispered faintly. Tracy looked up, down and across the living room, anywhere but directly at her husband. How long has he known, and how much? She thought in panic. Hmm... It's only been a few times, maybe since a month, Tracy lied. I'm sorry, it was a mistake. It was just sex. I don't love him, I only love you. Elliot stared at his wife. She was blatantly lying about her affair. The love he felt for his wife as the day began was slowly fading away. We'll talk again when you want to tell me the truth. Elliot glared angrily at his wife before heading to bed in the room where their son lived until he went to college two years ago. That night, Elliot didn't sleep a damn thing. Not only had his wife been cheating on him for some time, but she had also been outright lying to him, trying to find out exactly what he knew so she wouldn't have to confess everything. Elliot woke up early and left for work early, leaving the house for the first time in his life without kissing Tracy goodbye and telling her, I love you. She noted it immediately when she woke up and found that her husband had already left. Bohr expected to see Elliot at nine in the morning with a signed contract, so he was surprised when his secretary said Elliot was on the phone. What's the matter, cuckold? grinned Bohr, answering the phone. I've got a box of porno movies starring your wife waiting to be traded for the keys to your kingdom. Get your ass over here, big boy. It ain't happening, pussy. Not now, not ever. You want my business? You're gonna have to take it from my cold, dead fingers. You gonna blackmail me, asshole? Then do it. Wait, you don't want to back out, do you, Seaburns? He asked in a shaky voice. 
You think I'm kidding about releasing the video files? I mean, you've got clients, family, friends, and thousands of other people who will see what a slut your beautiful wife is. Well, asshole, that's her problem, not mine. She won't be my wife for too much longer, and I don't have to worry about what everyone will think of her, Elliot replied. And what about your two precious children? How are you going to explain everything to them? Burr didn't seem as cocky today as he had been yesterday. Elliot figured it was because he didn't think Elliot would be courageous enough to handle the predicament that was bound to befall him in this case. For his part, Elliot assumed it was Tracy's predicament. And what about the clients, Seaburns? They certainly won't be happy about it, will they? It won't affect Zyburn's customers in any way if the former owner's soon-to-be ex-wife is an all-time whore. I guess the salespeople will find it amusing before they get to the actual sales, Elliot pointed out. W what do you mean by former owner? Bohr asked. Oh, I forgot to mention that I sold the business yesterday, Elliot said in a low voice. I only got half of what it was worth, but what the hell? Now Joe Gagliardi owes me a huge debt. You sold Zyburns to Joe Gagliardi? That Joe Gagliardi? Papa Joe Gagliardi? Yes, yes, and yes, Elliot replied. It's time to run. Gotta start making retirement plans. Listen, asshole, I wasn't kidding. By the end of the day, these files will be all over the internet and in all mailboxes, Bohr shouted. Blah, 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 Elliot said and hung up. Boy, that was fun, he said to the group of people in his office after hearing the end of his conversation. Not four hours later, Elliot received his first phone call, predictably from Tracy. It seems someone had hacked her Facebook account and posted links to several videos starring her and Greg Silverman. Then there were emails sent to her entire contact list. To say she was furious would be the understatement of the year. What the fuck are you doing? She screamed at Elliot. I closed my Facebook page, but apparently you also sent out emails to everyone I knew, you stupid, vindictive asshole. I'm going to kill you, you bastard. She continued in this vein for another five minutes. Elliot put the phone down on the table, letting her rant. When she finally ran out of steam, Elliot picked up the phone again and calmly said he had nothing to do with it. In fact, this is the first time I've seen most of these videos. I almost threw up at the thought that you could be doing that shit with another man behind my back, you goddamn whore. But I know who did it, and so does your lover. Why don't you ask him yourself? He shouted back into the tube. What does Greg have to do with this asshole, and why? The line cut off. Elliot assumed she was calling her lover, so he held the phone in his hand. Ninety seconds later, he immediately realized who was calling again. Hello again, slut, Elliot replied nonchalantly. Don't tell me he's not answering. How did you know? Did you do something to him? She exhaled. Tracy's concerned tone pressed the wrong button for Elliot. In one sentence, she showed more concern for her lover than she did for him when he brought up her infidelity. To your Greg Silverman, I didn't do anything, Tracy. But since you're not asking, because I'm sure you don't want to know, I'll tell you that technically you were just an assignment for a highly paid male escort, a male whore. He was hired by Dan Baranski to seduce you and videotape it. All so he could blackmail me into selling him my company at a steep discount. He threatened to release the videos to me if I didn't go along with his plan. This loser was so sure that I would trade my company for your reputation. He never realized that once you turned into a whore, you didn't have a reputation to worry about, at least not for me. Anyway, I guess he was so pissed because I sold the company to Papa Joe Gagliardi that released all your greatest hits. You sold Seaburns? Tracy asked in a trembling voice. And because you sold your company, Dan Baranski released those videos? You could have stopped him, but you didn't? Elliot heard Tracy begin to sob. Why would I stop him? It's pretty clear to me that you no longer respect or love me. I loved you with everything I had for 22 years, and this is how you repay me for my love? Fuck you. Well, I guess you've actually been fucked over and over again, so why should I care if anyone knows you're an unfaithful whore? But the kids, my parents, pretty much everyone we know. Your problem, Elliot interrupted. In a few months, we'll be divorced. What if I don't want a divorce? She shot back. I've seen some videos, Tracy. You're absolutely in love with him and his big tool. If he didn't make you look like the biggest fool this side of the Rocky Mountains, you'd run to him in a heartbeat. I don't know why, but you've already left me behind. I guess my only question to you is, 
Why? Was it something I did or didn't do? There was silence between sobs. Truth be told, Tracy realized in that moment that she simply hadn't thought through her actions before. She admitted to herself that when it came to Greg, she was thinking with her wet pussy, not her brain. Ia, Ia, I think he was so sneaky that I never realized he was targeting me. He was so friendly, so sweet, so handsome. I must have developed feelings for him before we even slept together. Then, uh, as soon as we did. Okay, that part I've seen and heard. He's got a big magical friend and he knows how to use it. I heard you telling him that you could never be satisfied with mine again. Don't fight the divorce, Tracy. I'll show you more respect than you've shown me. And maybe, if you're lucky, your lover will love you for more than just the fee. Either way, you'll have more than enough money to live on, though maybe not quite in the style you're used to. Tracy's cries turned to sobs. After listening for about five more seconds, Elliot ended the conversation. Elliot hadn't even had time to get back to work when his phone rang again. He guessed that now was as good a time as any to deal with his daughter. Oh shit, Daddy, I can't even believe Mom did this. I'm guessing everyone at school has seen at least one of these videos. I'll never be able to show my face there again. His daughter sobbed over the phone. What are we gonna do? Well, personally, I'm going to divorce her as soon as possible. How about you? I think that's totally up to you. The fact that she's an internet star may be embarrassing at first, but I think in the end, you're just going to have to deal with it because there's nothing else you can do. I don't know if she's going to keep doing it, if only because her lover was a paid seducer. I have no idea if they're going to keep dating now that he's no longer being paid. Wait, are you saying that he was some kind of like, a male prostitute? Disgusting, she said. Yeah, that shows you everything she thinks of me, doesn't it? Elliot said. Can I stay with you until I go to college next year, Daddy? Of course you can, baby. The next phone call to Elliot was from his son. When's the divorce, Dad? He asked. The papers have already been filed. It's up to the clerks now, kid. That's all I needed to know, Dad. Call me when you want to talk. Thank you. I'll talk to you later, Elliot said. Two weeks later, Elliot, Tracy, and their lawyers met. Elliot noticed that his wife looked exhausted. Given some of the phone calls he had made during this time, Elliot could imagine how badly Tracy was taking things. The phone call he knew had come from her parents was probably the worst. Elliot and Tracy's parents had always been incredibly close, and their phone call to him had been filled with lots of tears and apologies from both of her parents. We're sorry, Al, we tried to raise her better, her father said at one point in the conversation. We thought we had raised her better. Obviously, we were wrong. Can I ask you one question, Elliot? Her father asked. Is it true that you didn't even think about trading your company for Tracy's videos and pictures? Absolutely true, Jack, Elliot said. If you watched any of those videos, you'd realize that there's no way I'd trade my company for a cheating whore in love with another man. I miss you, Elliot, Tracy said at the meeting with the lawyers. Can't we try to save our marriage? What marriage? You ruined it the first time you spread your legs for this guy. And it's not my fault if the man you love turned out to be a setup. And if you have any love left for me, it's at the bottom of your list, Elliot grinned. Tracy's attorney expressed shock at the amount of assets Elliot listed, especially after selling his expensive company. The total amount the couple owned was still substantial, but it was less than half of what Tracy and her attorney had hoped for. When the lawyer asked Elliot about the amount, his lawyer handed him a copy of Elliot's contract and the lawyer read aloud, as well as other consideration that cannot be expressed in money. What exactly does that mean, Mr. Seaburns? He asked, looking up over his reading glasses. It means that he owes me a favor that has no legal monetary expression, Elliot answered pathetically. Mr. Wilkins, as an officer of the court, you know you can't be party to fraud, right? If we find out it's some sort of service that has a monetary value, we'll amend our claim at that point, Attorney Tracy muttered. Mr. Jonas, I happen to know what the consideration is, and I can assure you, sir, that it has no legal value, said Elliot's attorney. Six months later, the divorce became final. During this period, neither Elliot nor Tracy went on any visits. In fact, Tracy rarely left the house at all because, after the video and photos were seen by many of her relatives and friends, she became something of an outcast. Meanwhile, Elliot's family and friends rallied around him. 
Six months after that divorce, Dan Baranski slipped in the shower and suffered a head injury that left him barely able to function normally. A day later, Greg Silverman was robbed outside a bar in Los Angeles. The robbers stripped him of $220, after which one of them destroyed both of Silverman's testicles with a brutal kick to the crotch with a steel-toed boot. The robbers were never found.